Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Liz Slade. I'm a lawyer in my day job, uh, but my real passion is film. Um, I've been coming to LSF since 2017, and I did Talent Campus 5. Uh, <laughs> um, I've done some moderating for Chris previously, and he kindly asked me here today. And I would like to introduce uh, William Nicholson, who's had a long and illustrious career as a writer. Uh, he's written novels for adults and children. He's written plays, um, and he's, had, he's written multiple screenplays that have been produced. He's been nominated for an Oscar twice. For sh <laughs> but I never won. <laughs> Um, for Shadowlands in 1994 and, of course, Gladiator in 2001. Uh, his other screenwriting credits are simply too numerous to list, but include First Night, Elizabeth the Golden Age, Nell, Le Miserable, Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom, um, and Breathe. He's also been nominated um, for a Tony, for an Emmy. He's been BAFTA nominated. And he's also directed um, two films that he wrote the screenplay for, um, Firelight and most recently, Hope Gap. It's a real privilege to have him speak to us today. Could you please make him welcome? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, Bill, there's a huge amount uh, that we could talk about today. You've had an incredible career as a writer thus far. Uh, but of course, our focus today is on screenwriting. So I understand that you wanted to be a writer from a young age, um, and you started off your writing career writing novels. How did you make the transition into screenwriting? That's quite right. Um, I, I wanted to be a novelist. I didn't really know anything about screen, screenwriting, television, anything like that. I was brought up on books. My, my mother was an English teacher. And I did English literature at university, so I wanted to be a great novelist, you know, sort of midway between Tolstoy and Proust. And um, I wrote eight novels between the age of about 16 and 32, uh, not, not a single one of which was published. I mean, not even, not, I mean, then it got nowhere, absolutely nowhere. Um, so I was very determined and also very misguided, I guess you would say. And of course, you can't live um, by writing novels that nobody buys. So I had a job and uh, I went from university into the BBC as a trainee and I moved through various departments. And uh, I still wanted to write, I was still writing my novels. I was getting up early in the morning to write my novels and going into the BBC at about 10, which maybe still happens, I don't know. And um, while I was in the BBC, um, they knew that I was writing these novels, and my boss in the department that I ended up in, which was the religious television department, and there's a reason for that. Um, I, I was raised very religious, but I'd lost all my, my faith long before. I was there because I thought it would give me an easy life to write the novels. And so there I was. Um, beavering away on the novels while knocking out not very good documentaries on sort of uh, religious subjects, spiritual subjects, ethical subjects. Um, I realized looking back, by the way, that I was completely deluding myself. I was there because I was really, really interested. Anyway, my boss said, we need, to, we, we've decided we're going to do a drama about the life of Martin Luther, not, not the black guy who got shot, okay? Martin Luther the monk. And, um, so we can't afford a writer, but apparently you write books. And I said, yes. And so he said, well, would you like to have a crack at knocking out a script? And we've got a director and we've got some money from the Lutheran church to make this uh, drama. And I liked the guy who was going to produce it and I liked the guy who was going to direct it. So I thought, well, all right, you know. So I took time out from my novels and wrote a 60 minute teleplay about Martin Luther. And I didn't, to be honest with you, regard it as an important project. And I think that might have been the secret. Um, I think my novels were overloaded by my yearning for greatness. And this was a craft job. And it actually came out quite well. 
And the guy who was going to be the producer, who was a colleague of mine, sent it to Jonathan Price, and he said, I like this, I'll do it. So they did it with Lutheran money and Welsh resources, by which I mean cameraman, design, that sort of thing. And it was made by the BBC religious department, and, and it transmitted, and you know, it was all right. People said, that's, that's, that's okay. I mean, nobody really noticed. But the three of us, the director, the producer, and me, the writer, kind of thought, this is fun, let's do it again. Can we find another subject that some more Americans can be persuaded to pay for? And we came up with C.S. Lewis, who is actually a sort of secular saint to a certain branch of American Episcopalians. And they produced some cash, and I wrote a script. I was busily doing my documentaries and my um, novels, but I squeezed in some time to, to write this script about this chap, C.S. Lewis, who I didn't really like, but I was kind of intrigued because I, it dawned on me the story I was writing about, although in a different era and a different age group, kind of paralleled my own emotional problems. And my own emotional problems at the time, I was like, how old was I? I suppose I was about 30, were an inability to commit to a love relationship. I was f obviously frightened of getting in deep, and so I would have affairs and then back out. And that's actually the core of what happens in the script I wrote, which was called Shadowlands, and that was um, made with um, Claire Bloom and Joss Ackland, and it won the BAFTA Best Drama of the Year Award. And that changed everything. So suddenly, everybody was coming to me and asking me to write for them. Um, and I then wrote a thing called Life Story, f f which also won the drama, the, the best BAFTA of the uh, award. And then I got various other scripts that, that suddenly got awards. And it was just extraordinary. It was like, where have, where have I been all my life? Why have I been piddling around with these novels when this is obviously what I can do? And I think what's interesting about that is that the piddling around with the novels, which had been going on a long time, had actually probably helped me a lot. But the crucial difference was, and, and you'll all know this if, if you do any work in screenwriting, you're not on your own. A whole lot of other people are messing with you. And they're saying, but you know, that's not working. And we want it to be this. And nobody's going to go if it's that. And I, I think I needed that. Um, I benefited from it. So without planning it, I had a screenwriting career. So that's how that happened. So in a way, you were an accidental screenwriter. Completely. And when you were moving between um, writing novels and writing plays, which you'd done, to screenwriting, how did you find that transition with you know, a different craft of writing? Um, I, I, I was thrilling because people were telling me that what I was doing was good, whereas the novels, they weren't telling me that. And th you have to have an awful lot of self-belief. I, I wrote eight of these no-good novels. And, you know, you live in a, uh, you live in a kind of bubble. You, you write something, and while you're writing, you think it's wonderful. When you finish, you think it isn't. And then when people tell you it isn't, you think, well, of course it isn't. But the next thing I do will avoid those errors. And so the bubble is inflated again, and you do the next thing. And that was why I hadn't completely crashed and burned and was still functioning. But to have, you know, to get awards, it's astonishing. You suddenly think, wow, you know, maybe I, maybe I am a writer after all. And so I dumped all the novels. That was it forget novels, and went fully into screenwriting. And then, of course, I discovered that the kind of freedom with which I'd written to start with, I was never going to be able to capture again. Because now I had a reputation, I had something to prove, people were making demands of me, and I was into the development process. I mean, I was starting to be paid proper money. And the development process, unlike writing novels, it is, is cruel, you know, it's hard. And so I then had this long stretch of, of writing and being beaten up by, by the development process. I mean, this is jumping ahead, but after a bit, it wore me out so much that I went back to novels. But I've done that all my life. 
So just coming back to um, Shadowlands, which you had written for television and a play, and then you adapted it for the big screen. It, that went on to be hugely successful, that film, you know, critically acclaimed, and you were nominated for an Oscar um, for your screenplay. What did that mean for your screenwriting career? That got me into Hollywood. So prior to that, I'd been British TV screenwriting. I think I wrote four TV films. Um, uh, maybe, maybe it was five. Um, after I got nominated for the Oscar, in fact, once the script was circulating in Hollywood, because it was originally going to be made by Sidney Pollock, and then he pulled out and Richard Attenborough made it, um, the office started coming in. My London agent said, you need an LA agent. So I was signed up with CAA, which was then the, the biggest. And I started to get serious offers of big films um, and flown across the Atlantic first class and met by limousines and all that kind of stuff, which doesn't actually happen anymore. But back then, everybody was very flush. The Hollywood was very, very flush and, and self-indulgent. So it changed a lot. And you know, in retrospect, I'm not sure that was a good thing. I think if I'd stayed in the UK and stayed writing smaller scale, lower budget, things I, over which I would have had a bit more control. I think maybe I would have done better work. It's, it's very hard to tell. So from, um, from Shadowlands, as you said, you went on to write some fairly big films, including um, Nell, um, First Night, which was a very big film at the time. I remember seeing it in the cinema. And um, you had some wonderful credits, but the one that I wanted to talk about now, which I'm sure a lot of people are interested in, is Gladiator, which is personally one of my favorite films and to this day the best cinema experience that I've had. Um, a truly wonderful film. Um, we've got a short clip to show from it. Could we have that now please? Rise. Rise. Your fame is well-deserved, Spaniard. I don't think there's ever been a gladiator to match you. As for this young man, he insists you are Hector Reborn. What was it Hercules? Why doesn't the hero reveal himself and tell us all your real name? You do have a name. My name is Gladiator. How dare you show your back to me? Slave! Will you remove your helmet and tell me your name? My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the north, general of the Felix Legions, loyal servant to the true emperor, Marcus Aurelius, father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something funny about that. Um, just about a month ago, I received a package via FedEx, and it was from Russell Crowe, and it was a watch and he had had 35 of these made by an Italian watchmaker. And the uh, hands on the watch are little swords. And engraved on the bezel all the way around are those lines. Um, and it was to celebrate 21 years of, um, of Gladiator. And mine was number 15 of the 35. So it's huge. I couldn't possibly wear it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that was very, very sweet. That's amazing. And um, his delivery of that, that line as well is incredible. Um, could you tell us how did you come to be involved in that project? Yeah, sure. I, I, was, um, I was absolutely not hired for, to do Gladiator. I was working with the producer, Doug Wick, on a completely different project um, when the, he and he was doing Gladiator. And it ran into a lot of trouble. 
when uh, they started, um, they did a deal with Ridley Scott, which is called pay or play, which you may be familiar with, which means they're going to pay the guy even if they don't make the film. And they'd also committed to building a lot of sets in, in um, Malta. So they were like 20 million down already. And uh, they had the first reading of the script with the cast, which is standard in films. You have it um, shortly before you start shooting. And it was a disaster. And in fact, Russell Crowe walked out and a lot of the other cast complained. And it turned out what had happened was they'd got the early drafts in and Ridley Scott had committed and the drafts weren't working. But the, the thinking always is, we'll get there. Don't worry, we'll get there. And they'd obviously told Ridley, um, Russell Crowe, don't worry, we'll get there. And now here they were reading it out and they hadn't got there. It wasn't working. So they were due to start shooting in uh, like, I think, a week, something like that, two weeks. And um, so Doug Wick said to me, we are in a problem here, would you take a look at the script? And uh, I'm no doubt he said that to many people. So I took a look at the script and, and I said, look, you know, you've got a really interesting revenge story here, but, but that's all it is. I mean, why would I care about a guy who chops people up? And uh, okay, so the emperor is bad and he chops up and so on, but I, I'm not engaged. I, 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 it's not my kind of thing. If you want a fight movie, fine, don't come to me. And he said, well, what do you think we should do? And so I wrote out about three pages of suggestions, very simple stuff. He sent that off to um, uh, um, Walter Parks, who, who was the exec producer. And uh, Walter said, uh, hire him. Um, give him whatever he needs and hire him. So I was hired for two weeks. And it's a thing called a production rewrite. All these things are very specific in, in the film business. Production rewriters are a very special breed of people. You get paid a lot of money and you hit it hard and then you go away and you don't get a credit or anything. So I uh, settled down and I did my two weeks work and um, they, the first um, shooting they were going to do was a four week shoot of the big battle that the film begins with, which didn't require me at all. However, I came up with a series of ideas which started to infect even the battle scenes. And uh, so they found themselves dropping in the, the, my lines into the, the battle scenes. Um, essentially, what I said is two things. The central character must love somebody. I don't, I'm not interested in a main character who just hates somebody. You've got to love somebody. And uh, who's that going to be? So he's got to, the options are he can love his wife, he can love his son, he can love the sister of, of uh, Commodus. You know, there are various options here. I decided not to go for the, the kind of comp competing for uh, the sister of, of Commodus. It was too um, kind of, I don't know, too political and messy. And uh, I thought the simplest thing is here is he loves his wife. But his wife is dead. So how can he go on with that? And I thought well, the simple answer is the afterlife. So we'll put an afterlife thread all through this. And he, what he wants is to reconnect with his wife in the afterlife. Everything else is just getting in the way, really. And I said, I don't want him to be a soldier. I want him to be a farmer. I want him to be somebody who just happens to be really good at killing people, but that's not his thing. And then we can love him. So I wrote all of this in and started um, suggesting where we could put this into the script. And in, in the battle scene, I don't know if you remember, but there's a bit where they're galloping along and somebody says, what's going on? And he says, don't worry, don't ask any questions. If you find that it's all gone green or something, we're, we're dead and, uh, don't, and we'll all meet again in the next life. So I started throwing in all these thoughts that everybody's looking all the time to the next life. And um, they liked what I was doing and they said, would you carry on, please? Because as the shooting proceeded, everything I did had an impact on the rest of it. So in the end, I was on the film right the way through to the end of the shoot, writing all the time, just a little bit ahead of the shoot. And, uh, and that was wonderful. I absolutely loved it. And uh, I had terrific fun. I didn't feel any sense of ownership. I didn't feel this is my film. I was helping. And um, in fact, there were four of us. There was uh, obviously Ridley Scott, whose brilliance comes out in every 
every frame. There was Doug Wick, the producer, there was Walter Parks, the executive producer, and there was me. And Walter was in Los Angeles, and we were all on the location. And so at lunchtime, I would meet with Ridley and go over the new ideas, and in the evening, we would be in, uh, in the loop with Walter Parks in LA, uh, deciding what to do. And this made it very, very hard for all of the crew, who, I mean, the designer, I remember coming up to me and saying, I built a bathhouse, Where, where's the bathhouse scene? And I said, there isn't a bathhouse scene. And uh, he said, well, I built it. So I said, well, I'll write a bathhouse scene if somebody wants a bathhouse scene, but right now, that's not in my idea of the film. There was no bathhouse scene. And other p characters would come up to me and say, um, you know, my character, like some of the minor gladiators, my character, wouldn't it be exciting if my character, you know, developed the, they all wanted their parts to grow. And Russell Crowe found it very, very difficult because the script was changing under him all the time. And that is really tough. And uh, it made him, you know, quite aggressive. But, <laughs> but he's brilliant, completely brilliant. And, you know, you can tolerate anything from somebody who's, who's, who's that brilliant. And he was carrying a lot of weight on his shoulders. It was a very expensive film. They were churning half a million dollars a day while they were shooting. So everybody was in a great tense state. But I wasn't. I was sitting in my trailer with my laptop, having a lovely time, <laughs> pumping out ideas and scenes. Um, so anyway, the end result of all of that is I am one small part of that wonderful film, and I'm very proud to have been part of it. The odd thing was I got a credit, because I shouldn't have done. Production rewriters don't get credits. They get money instead. But I mean, the fact is I made a big impact on that film and when the credit analysis was done because these things are arbitrated I don't know if you know that credits are arbitrated by panels created by the Writers Guild all film credits are controlled by writers themselves not by the producers or the directors it's uh, so if there's a, if there's not a dispute that's fine if there is a dispute and I'm in one now myself it goes to a panel and the panel is anon anonymous we writers are anonymous they look at the scripts and they decide who gets credit and I ended up with the credit, which is how come I ended up in line for uh, an Oscar. And, uh, and I, it was just, the whole thing was, was wonderful. And when you were talking about um, bringing that concept of the afterlife to Gladiator, I mean, that's what gives the film a lot of its emotional depth because you couldn't have had the ending that you have of that film without that because you can't just kill off your protagonist, your hero, and it, it would just imagine if you didn't have that, it would fall very flat. But I, I find that very interesting in Gladiator and some of your other films, um, given your background, because you were raised a Catholic and you went to um, a Catholic school, that a lot of your um, films explore this idea of God and religion and the afterlife, and that's something that you brought um, to Gladiator particularly, which I think is really interesting. Yes, I think so. I mean, I think for, <clears throat> for, for everybody here, the message isn't, you know, rush off and stick religion in films. The, 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 mes <laughs> the message is y you have to get your ending right. Your ending has to give deep satisfaction. And that deep satisfaction doesn't come about through a happy ending. It comes about through a right ending, a fitting ending. Um, I mean, whether it's a clever plot, it's got to have a satisfying twist at the end. But on the whole, what makes an ending satisfying is to do with your relation to the central characters. If you're engaged by the central characters, you will want them to reach a certain point by the end, and you, the writer, have got to deliver that. So I tend to construct everything I do from the end backwards. Um, I think, where are we going to end, and how do we get there? in such a way that it's not so obvious that the audience is, you know, bored by the... I mean, I don't know if any of you saw the recent, relative, relatively recent series called The Undoing um, on television. It was a very, very skillful piece of work um, about a guy who... Um, he, he, there's a murder, and we don't know who's done it, but at the beginning it looks like it's the, the husband who's, who's Hugh Grant. And as it goes on, it looks more and more like it's Hugh Grant. And we're thinking, God, this is clever. Who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? And in the end, it's Hugh Grant. And of course, <laughs> this completely killed the whole thing. <laughs> I, I was just so disappointed because you're expecting a brilliantly clever twist. Now, I don't go in for clever twists, but what I do try to go in for is character development and satisfaction. 
you want at the end to feel that somebody has got somewhere <laughs> as a result of this process in a sense that they have earned the ending. Um, and <clears throat> it's difficult, it's hard to do. But that is why I always say to people, think about your ending from a very, very early stage because that's when people walk out of that cinema, that's what will affect their reaction to your film. You kind of had wonderful stuff all along. I mean, I, I, I very much liked, well, actually I didn't, but I was at Quentin Tarantino's recent film, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But, you know, I walked out of the cinema really pissed off. And <clears throat> I think he hadn't thought his way through about how the, the effect of the ending would, would, would have on us all. It was a lot, of, a lot of virtuoso moments along the way, but not, it didn't give you that gratifying sense that you've been present at, I think the simple word is a story, you know, a story. Stories have endings. Yeah, and the, and the ending of Gladiator, you know, as we were talking about, it's, it's very emotional because of that emotional depth and connection that you have to the character. One other interesting thing about the ending of that film was that, you know, of course, as most people will know, just before the end of the shoot, Oliver Reed, um, of course, died. And I understand you then had to to rewrite some of those scenes based on that. How difficult was that to do at that late stage? It, it, it was very difficult. I mean, I, I remember um, uh, when Oliver Reed died, he was supposed, what was supposed to happen at the end of Gladiator, the very final scene, uh, you probably won't remember, but there's a sort of wooden sword. And the very final scene, um, Proximo, the, the Gladiator owner, trainer, was supposed to take the wooden sword into the empty arena and stick it in the dirt and say, free at last, gladiator, free at last. And that had resonance because it was him acknowledging that his uh, creature, who he had tried to manipulate but had ended up admiring, was somebody who he, as it were, backed. So it had emotional power. And they hadn't shot that scene. And Oliver Reed died. Oliver Reed had sworn not to drink. And just a couple of days before his last shoot, he went on a bender and it killed him. And it produced a huge problem. And I went to the editor and said, let's look at all of the outtakes that we've got of Proximo, of Oliver Reed, to see what we can build. Um, and uh, the editor, I remember the editor showed me a scene where it's, uh, there was a cafe, a sort of Roman cafe, and Proximo's there and he stands up to walk away and in this particular take he tripped and fell. And the editor said, look, you know, here we've got him falling. So what we could do is we could have somebody with an arrow, bow and arrow, shooting and, and hear a thud and then he falls. Because I'd said, he's a major character. We've got to finish him off. He's got to have an ending. And I said, you can't have somebody shoot him in a cafe for no reason. <laughs> you know, it, the, it's like ending the whole movie. Endings have to be emotionally earned. And so, um, so he said, what do you want? And I said, well, we're going to have to... We're going to have to give him the moment in which he dies because he realizes that he's on the side of our hero. So we worked out that he was going to take the keys, release him, release uh, Russell Crowe, and then he was going to walk back to his, knowing that the, uh, the Praetorian guards were going to come and kill him. And we know it, and he knows it, and he's accepted that, and that is going to give him dignity and death. So obviously we didn't have him doing this, but we had body doubles. We could have body doubles do a lot of the walking stuff. When he stands looking at um, uh, Russell Crowe, we could have a shot of him from elsewhere and CGI some bars across it, looking at it from Russell Crowe's point of view, and a hand hands over the keys. All of that can be done wordlessly. We understand exactly what he's doing. He walks away. We know he's accepting his death. He goes and he sits down and he's got his back to us. And then we found one outtake of him actually going into the Colosseum before one of the gladiatorial fights and he says um, uh, what is it dust and uh, shadows and dust and he says it about five times shadows and dust and he tries very shadows and dust and he tries again, shadows and dust. lots of various takes so he said let's have the really soft one and so there is on his face the real Oliver Reed saying shadows and dust and uh, then you cut to behind him and the Praetorians come in and they kill him. And so the whole thing created an ending for him by a bit of jiggery-pokery. And it worked, worked very well. So then we had to have somebody else do the last bit with the wooden sword. So we gave that to Juba. And uh, he, he does that last scene. And the thing that's really interesting is, 
you know, we know that Oliver Reed died, but if you didn't know and you were just watching that film, it all fits perfectly and you would never know everything that had gone on behind the scenes because it all it works in the story, you know, all the sort of, you know, mental problem solving you had to do and the practical side of it, you know, it, it fits and it, and it works, which, you know, is, is amazing and a different side of a screenwriting that you wouldn't really think of and obviously very unusual. And, um, you know, that film obviously was hugely successful and you were Oscar nominated um, for the the screenplay. What was that experience like for you? The, that particular one was wonderful. When I went for the Oscars for Shadowlands, it was kind of awful because nobody else on the film had been nominated, and I was all on my own. Uh, well, I had my wife with me, but it was it was kind of weird. It was like I didn't know anybody, and I felt no no part of it. It was all very depressing, and these enormous parties were going on to which we weren't invited. And so I didn't enjoy it at all. Um, And the Oscars is a weird sort of experience. It's very controlled. You know, the seats in the auditorium have to be full all the time. So the minute anybody gets up, somebody rushes in and sits down in the seat. They have lots of people in the aisles all dressed up in dinner jackets, ready to sit in empty seats. And um, uh, so I didn't enjoy it. With Gladiator, we were a big gang. And I'd been part of Hollywood by then for 10 years, you know, and I knew a lot of people. And it was a blast. It really was. And we stayed with the producer, and my kids all came, and we won the Oscar, not me personally, but the film did. So we had a gold statuette to hold, and we, um, <clears throat> we, had, we went to a big party, and it was really, really good fun, I must say. It's, it sounds like an amazing experience, and of course, that's what you know people dream about is is getting to go to the Oscars. So you know, congratulations! It's incredible, you know, being Oscar nominated twice. So you've written numerous screenplays. You've gone through you know the Hollywood machine. What have you learned about the business side of screenwriting that you didn't know when you set out on this career that would be useful for anyone who is new to the industry to know? Sure. Um, I mean, the big. The big problem with screenwriting is you can't write a screenplay and issue it yourself. You've got to get people to shoot it before it exists. Um, And that is really, really hard if you don't already have a name. Um, I mean, I, as I've described to you, came via television writing. Um, It's almost impossible to get a spec script taken up. that means that you've you've really got only two choices. One is to uh, write and direct and produce the whole thing yourself on your iPhone in your backyard, which, by the way, I think is quite a good idea, and quite a few people do it. And if you are a genius, then you know you'll put it out on YouTube, and everybody will realize it. But short of that, the big problem is connecting your work with the people you need to take it to the next stage. You do need an agent, I'm sure you all know that. They won't really look at anything that doesn't come through an agent. It's gotta come through an agent. Um, So how do you get an agent? How do you show from the beginning that you are a distinctive voice, a a, a writer that people are going to to want to take seriously? It's very... (laughs) I find it very baffling, and my daughter's in the industry now, and she's, she's doing a lot of reading. She's like a script editor, and uh, a lot of stuff comes through. And I say, how do you know how, that somebody's good? And she says, well, actually, you do know. Um, so if you've got something that you've written that's the first three pages, that's all they're going to read. If the first three pages sound fresh and exciting, you're in with a chance on, the, on these heaps of, of stuff. The second thing is about subject matter. It's dawned on me over the years. I used to think that, because I was raised through writing you know, novels and all that kind of stuff, I, I used to think that what mattered was the distinctive voice of the writer. That is true if you're a genius. You know, if you're Michaela Cole, that's probably true, or maybe Phoebe Waller-Bridge. But for most of us, your distinctive voice is something nobody is interested in. What they're interested in is the subject matter. If you come to them with a subject that they immediately light up about, and these change all the time. You know, right now we're in a particular phase 
where certain subjects are going to be of much more interest than others. There's a lot of interest in any really good story with a diverse cast. And, you know, that sounds cynical, but actually it's a very, very good thing because it's changing the landscape. So you need to think to yourself, what subject can I write about that is more interesting than me? And then you're in with a chance. Um, and the second thing about it is, people are going to look at it very, very briefly. Um, they're probably only going to read the one-page cover you've got on it. And they're going to think to themselves, you know, does this story work? How can I cast it? These are the kind of things that are happening. So that's the stage of, of getting you in. Once you start the process, if somebody hires you, you will then find yourself going through a thing called development. And this is where the, uh, the people who work with the producer, who are often very young, um, will read your work as you write it and will guide you on how to make it better. And this can be a tough process. Um, on the whole, they're quite polite, but you'll find a lot of the use of the first person plural. So you'll get notes, they call them notes, you'll get notes back saying, I think we took a wrong turn when we decided to go to Madagascar in Act 2. And of course, when they say we, they didn't do that, you did it. So what they're actually saying is, you got it wrong. But they're covering that up. And the pretense is, this is a sort of group endeavor. In fact, it's you, and you have got to deal with the fact that all the time you're being told you've got something wrong. And this knocks your confidence. And often you'll begin with a project full of excitement because you can see it in your mind and you can see how it's going to work. And this process of being told that character doesn't work, that storyline doesn't work, we don't think this is good, we're bored, can really kill your confidence. And when your confidence goes, you become useless. You start saying, well, what am I to do? Tell me what to do. You don't want them to go to Madagascar. Where shall I send them? Which, of course, is not the answer either because they don't actually know. They're reacting to what you give them. So what I would say about the development process is do your best to pick up the criticisms that resonate with you, ignore the ones that don't, and when the, the, when the criticism comes in that you think, yeah, do you know what, I always thought that was weak, you have got to solve it. Don't wait for them to solve it. That's not their job, it's your job. So say to them, fine, I hear you, leave it with me. Then you go back in, and that can re-excite you, because you can think, actually, this could be exciting again. So you have to develop this pattern, and it's a kind of mental hygiene thing. It's, it's, it's really difficult, actually, and I mean, I've just finished a script, well, it's been shot now, um, called 13 Lives, which is about the Thai boys who got stuck in a cave. And uh, it's been shot by Ron Howard, paid for by MGM, and it's coming out in April. I've done 24 drafts all along over the last two years. Um, it's not all I've been doing, by the way. I've, I've done other things at the same time. Um, all along, you almost have to treat each new draft as if you're starting completely from scratch. You think, I can't even remember what I did before. What's this? Is this exciting me? Do the characters come to life? The main problem with that story was it's very complicated technically and there's a lot of stuff to explain and explaining is always very difficult in films. So a lot of it, the 24 drafts are all pretty similar to be honest, but we're constantly trying to get information in and deal with minor characters. Um, and you have to have, you'll gather from that, an awful lot of stamina. So you may be a genius who writes one draft and it's picked up and shot the way you wrote it, which happened to me, by the way, my first time, <laughs> and it never happened since. Um, and fine, good, good luck to you, but it's much more likely you will have to learn the skill of, of surviving criticism and feeding on it and making it work for you. Um, and if you do this, the people you work with will realize you're a professional and they'll want to work with you again, whereas if you have hissy fits and panic attacks, which a lot of people do, and spend your entire time being needy and emotional, they're going to get tired of you. Because it's just, you know, everybody's stressed in the making of films. Everybody's career is on the line with every film. 
And they don't need you getting all emotional and weepy on them and saying, but aren't I any good? They need you to deal with the problems. And so I think it's almost a Zen attitude you need. Like, that was then. That's gone. This is now. I'm now launching into this moment. I have this scene, and I'm going to see this afresh and make this wonderful. And then you send it to them, and they say, that didn't work. It's gone. Forget that. Now I'm back in the present moment, and I'm doing this now. And that way you can survive. Um, so I, I, it is, by the way, it can be very, very unpleasant, and it can be very depressing. And then you do all this work, and then you get sacked. Or, and I've been sacked many, many times. I counted up. I've now got 13 lives will be my 20th shot film that's actually out there. Now, that is pretty good. I mean, I'm very, very old, it's true. But I'm 73 now. So in a long life of writing, 20. And I've probably written 60, you know? So you're going to get sacked. You're going to get things come to nothing. And you've got to be able to keep going. Because if you can't keep going, stop now. It's that hard. And the thing that is different um, when you're writing a screenplay as opposed to writing a novel is that the film industry is collaborative. When you're writing a novel, you're doing that in isolation. But as you've said, when you're writing a screenplay, you have to work with other people and you're part of this sort of big project. You know, it's not done in isolation. So... You know, that being the case, how important has building relationships been to your screenwriting career and to get you hired for projects again and again? It's been quite important. <clears throat> I, I've done a lot of work with the same people um, because if you get on with people, then they like having you and they, and they ask you back. Um, I've also had a lot of very new people find me and, and come to me as, as I've grown older, and that's been exciting. Um, so I think it it isn't... It isn't vital, but the point is somebody's got to know about you. Otherwise, why are they going to come to you? You know. So you need networking is important. People need to have seen your work, um, and they need to have heard from other people that you're good. And there's a lot of gossip in the business. Uh, people will say, you know, oh, I've been working. Actually, it's not even gossip. It's almost like fashion. Certain writers become hot. Everybody wants them, and they. The usual pattern is they do a brilliant piece of work, everybody wants them, they overcommit, the work goes downhill, and then nobody wants them anymore. So you, you have to kind of play that one as carefully as you can. I've never been really hot, but I've been kind of warm, you know? And <laughs> that's been good, and that's worked well for me. It hasn't helped me. I've still written endless things which I thought were brilliant, still think are brilliant, and have never, ever been made. And it's kind of heartbreaking to have them sitting there. But then you think to yourself, well, come on, you know, what do you expect? This is, you're lucky to get anything at all. Actually, that's another thing. Expectation is a big thing. You have to frame your expectation correctly. If your idea is, I will write a script, it will be made into a movie, and the next thing I'll be getting a BAFTA, then you're in for trouble. But if you, you frame your expectation as, if I can just keep going and have people occasionally pay me, I'm winning. And <laughs> you are, actually, because everybody wants to write screenplays. Every time I get in a taxi, if they know me, they say at the end, oh, by the way, I hope you don't mind, but I've got a screenplay I'd like you to read. <laughs> and, uh, and I say, why are you giving it to me? I'm not a producer. You're my com competition. I'm going to burn it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so um, I, I think it is, yes, networking is important, but something more is important. Creating a group of friends who you work with and work with again and again. And you, if you look around the world of filmmaking, you'll see a lot of people are mini teams who've gone on through together. They've learned to trust each other. They've learned to tell each other the truth. And if you find yourself in such a situation, hold on to them, go back to them, go on working with them, even if you get more glamorous offers elsewhere. And one thing I think um, that you do very well, you know, watching your films, um, you know, in preparation for our conversation now is connecting your audience to an emotion. Because I noticed when I was watching some of your films, how many times I cried in them. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, Gladiator re-watching that. It's so emotional at the end. I mean, 
Shadowlands I pretty much sobbed through. And I was telling you just before about Breathe when I saw that in the cinema and, and cried through the credits in my seat. Is that something that you're very mindful of that you, you know, in your stories that you want to connect your audience to, to a strong emotion and get them to feel something? Very much so. I mean, I think, I think storytelling and cinema, television, is all about emotion. I mean, emotion doesn't just mean crying. It, it, the emotion may be laughter, it may be fear, um, it may be wonder, but you've got to deliver it. You've got, you know, it's, it's not just information. Um, so obviously you're dealing in emotion. And how do you create emotions? You create emotions by creating characters who we care about and feel for. So it does come down, down to character. I have a very, um, some would say, sentimental side, and I do, I do like to go deep into those moments when I feel people are touching something very profound and perhaps hurtful inside them and working through it. And often that does mean that I write scenes that, that make you cry or that are supposed to make you cry. Um, but there's no need at all to, I mean, I, I so admire people who make you laugh, you know. I think that's just such a talent. Um, whatever it is, there's got to be some... We are in the business of emotion. That's what we're doing. Um, it, and even if, even if you're doing a, a, a thriller where it's all about who killed somebody, you've got to get some emotion in there so that when the climax comes, it's not just a kind of, oh, okay, that was it. It it's, gives you that satisfaction of something, of an emotional closure. So I do think you should say to yourself when you uh, embark upon any screenplay or any story, what emotion am I eliciting here? How am I doing it? How am I going to deliver it? And is it earned? Because I think too often um, films create the expectation of an emotional climax and then they deliver what should be the emotional climax, but they haven't done the hard work in between of making you earn it. You can have a, a story where two lovers uh, part, have parted and then you know, they long to be together again and then eventually they're together again. And it can leave you completely cold because nobody's made you feel A, that they really did love each other in the first place and B, that there was ever any problem. So you think, what took you so long? You know? So you've got to work out how to dramatize your chosen emotion, whatever it is. And if it's horror, I don't do horror, but, but if it's horror, you've got to work out at what point am I gonna hit people with this horror? And why are they caring? They're not caring because they and their seats think it's happening to them. They're caring because it's happening to a, a character on screen. So again, you're back to character. And most stories, most films are about somebody who wants something very, very much. And you, the audience, are made to want it with them. And then they can't get it, and they can't get it, and they can't get it, and then they do get it. And usually, the, the, the trajectory is they don't get it in the end the way they thought they were going to get it. But they do get the thing. The thing and, and you're very, then very satisfied by that. So, I mean, I'm being very crude here, but it, you can reduce things to something as simple as that. So when somebody pitches a story to me, and you know, after five minutes of pitch, I still don't know, you know who wants what. And I say, hold on here, you know, you've got a lovely, intricate story, but I have no idea why I want to watch it. Go back to the beginning. Tell me who I'm caring about here. And by the way, it doesn't have to be good people. Um, I'm an enormous admirer of succession, which seems to me to be one of the great achievements of the 21st century. And I don't like any of the characters, but I'm very, very engaged. I care all the time about what's happening between them, and that's a, a brilliant achievement to have pulled that off and still carrying on. Yes, because you want to make the audience care, which I wish I think, you know, and then you're connecting them to the story, of course. Um, I just want to talk briefly about um, directing before we move on to questions. So you've directed two films yourself that you wrote, um, Firelight and recently Hope Gap. So what was the appeal of directing your own films for you? And also, why did you have um, such a long gap between your directing, which was, I think, about 20 years? So the first time round, I'd just written a film called Nell for Jodie Foster, and uh, the people at um, Fox who, who made it said to me, have you ever thought of directing? 
And I said, no, I'm a writer. And they said, honestly, writers make really good directors. You don't have to be a directing genius like Ridley Scott. But as a writer, you know the characters and you know the story will surround you with very good people, particularly a good um, uh, cinematographer. And, you know, why not? And by then, I'd done a lot of work in Hollywood and become very frustrated with the way my scripts had been mangled by the directors. So I was obviously excited at the thought that I could do control my own script. So I said, okay, you know, I'll give it a shot. And my children were quite small at the time, and I wrote a story that meant we could shoot it all very close to my home. And, uh, and we, we did it, and, and I absolutely loved doing it. And at the end of it, um, by then, I didn't actually do it for Fox. I did it, curiously, for Disney. Um, I remember I had a budget of $9.7 million, which in Disney was regarded as, as chump change. They hardly noticed, but to me it was masses. And by the way, today is masses, again. And um, Joe Roth was then in charge at Disney, and he, he saw the, the finished result, and he said, you know, you're an even better director than you are writer. This is wonderful. I'm going to give this to the head of a company we've just bought to distribute it because he specializes in this sort of film and that was Harvey Weinstein so and Disney had just bought Miramax so Harvey Weinstein took the film over and basically destroyed it um, over a period of 18 months he kept on having it recut he kept on having uh, test screenings of a totally inappropriate sort in uh, I don't know if you know New York there's a cinema there called the Angelica which is very very cool and if you go there, you're a singleton, and you're hip, and you're probably gay. And my film was a, a, a family melodrama, really, and totally unsuitable. We'd had screenings in Sherman Oaks in uh, Los Angeles and in Hawthorne, New Jersey, which is family land, which had scored astonishingly well. In the Angelica, it completely bombed every screening. And Harvey said, we have to win this crowd because you have a film with uh, my, my actors were Sophie Marceau, who's French, Stephen Delane, who nobody had ever heard of. It's historical, therefore it's an art film, therefore we must win the art crowd. And I said, it's not an art film. It's a family melodrama. But he wouldn't listen, as he never did. And so he had editors sitting at the back of these screenings, and he said, every time there's an inappropriate laugh, make a note and cut out the line that led to it. So this mangled version emerged after 18 months. And I was crushed. And um, I and the producer then said, it's still not working. Can I please revert to my original cut? And he said, we've spent too much money on cutting rooms to do any more. So Brian and I, the producer, said, we will pay for the cutting room time to get it back. And we did, and out of our own pockets. And we got it back to my version. Harvey wasn't interested. It had a sort of a release, and it died. Now, it could be that the film is just crap anyway, but I loved it, and I still love it, but it broke my heart, the whole process, and so I said, okay, I can't escape the torment of being a screenwriter by being a director, I'll go back to novels. So I went back to writing books, and I wrote a book for my kids, well, not for my kids, for kids, called The Windsinger, and I sold that, and it was a big, big success, and won a lot of awards, and I, suddenly I was writing YA novels. So I got back into novel writing. And from then I went on and wrote some adult novels, which has been a great joy. Uh, I wouldn't say they've been hugely successful. They've had excellent reviews, but they've not been massive sellers. So I went back to writing screenplays to, to, to pay the bills. So ever since then, I've moved back and forth um, be between the two. But uh, more recently, 20 years have gone by, I had a very personal story to tell. And I thought, you know what? Why don't I try directing again? So, um, so I did, and very, very cheap film. Well, cheap, four and a half million pounds it cost to make, with Annette Bening, Bill Nye, and Josh O'Connor. And I absolutely loved it. It's about me and my parents, and very personal. Shot it in my hometown, and it exists, and I love it. It's not been a, a big success, but. As a matter of fact, it did win one award. It got the best film at the Barcelona Film Festival. That's the, the most I've managed with that one. Um, and I absolutely loved it, and I would love to do it again, but we are in a strange time. It's really, really difficult to get indie films off the ground. I am not the ideal uh, writer-director for this moment. 
I'm male and I'm white and I'm old, and that's not what the industry currently wants, which is pretty good actually because you know I've had a good shot, I've had a good run. Um, you know, time for younger people who look different to me to to occupy the space. So I'm not complaining. Um, but I'm still trying to get other films off the ground. And meantime, I'm doing Jobs for Hire, like the 13 Lives film. Um, but I have to say that directing your own film is the ultimate experience. It is the best. Anybody who writes films will want to direct. You just will, because you'll be driven nuts by the director not getting it right. Um, and I do strongly recommend it. Do not think you can't do it. You can. You are supported by brilliant talent. The craft talent in this country is astounding. I had a cinematographer who was absolutely amazing. I had a first assistant who was absolutely amazing. And of course, I had actors who were absolutely amazing. So you can do it. All you have to know is what you want. They'll work out how to do it. So I strongly recommend it if you ever, ever get the chance. And I would love to get the chance again. Thank you. That's really encouraging. I am um, sorry, we're, we're running slightly late, but we have some time for questions. Um, are we writing them down on the paper? Sure. Just With your knowledge today, if you could give some advice to your 16-year-old self who was grappling with the decision whether to write a novel or to write a screenplay, which one would you advise and why? So which would I do to my 60 or 16-year-old? 60. 60, okay. 13 years ago for me. Uh, 16. 16. 16. Starting 16. out. Teenager. Starting out. Yes. I, I would say write a screenplay. I mean, I, I think the future is, is screen. I really, really do. I think the most exciting work is happening on screen. What we're seeing now on, on television and on the streamers is astonishing. Um, it, it's wide open. They, they, they are willing to take a tremendous variety of, of topics. You can be bold. So I, 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 would, uh, I would say definitely go for screen, go for small screen, and, you know, go for broke. It's, it's, uh, it's a very, very exciting time. And if anybody's 16-year-old here, go for it. Anyone else want to pop up? Would you like to come up to the microphone? And if anyone else has a question, if you can just sort of get... Um, could you talk about some of your, like, unproduced projects or projects that you really like to get made that haven't been made? Do I have projects that I'd like to get made that haven't been made? Yeah. I mean, God, I've got dozens. I've got drawfuls of the stuff. <laughs> the problem is, a lot of it was paid for by Hollywood Studios. And uh, the Hollywood Studios do not like projects that they have uh, rejected being made by somebody else, because it makes them look bad. Um, and, uh, and they have a thing called turnaround, which means I have the right to s let somebody else do it, but they have to pay the costs up to that point. So if I wrote it 20 years ago and I was paid you know, quite a lot of money for it, they'll take that money and multiple interest at 10% over 20 years. So suddenly it is impossible because it's too expensive, um, which is kind of tough. I mean, I, I've had some scripts which... I had one that I wrote that the minute I wrote it, it was grabbed by Paula Wagner, who was uh, Tom Cruise's uh, producing partner, for him to do. And they held it for a year, and then they let it go. And then it went to uh, David Fincher and Brad Pitt, who were working as a team, and they were going to do it for a while. And then they didn't. And uh, I mean, they didn't because Brad, uh, David Fincher said, I want to, I need $180 million, and I'm doing it in black and white. And the studio <laughs> said, no. And um, it's still there. It's still a wonderful script, but it's it's dead. It's dead. And goodness knows how many of these there are are around. Yeah, I have a huge amount of stuff. I mean, if anybody wants to 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 pop up and off, offer to buy all my old scripts off me, I'd <laughs> be very very happy. Hi. Um, g given that you write in both mediums, how do you know whether um, a speculative idea is a novel or a screenplay? Yeah, um, is, is it a novel or is it a screenplay? Um, I think they are very, very different animals. The thing about a novel, and the reason I love novels, is because they are interior, or can be. Um, you can go inside the minds of your characters. Uh, they're kind of designed for that. So if what you want to write about is the complexity of what's happening inside people, 
the novel is the place to go. It's quite hard to do that in film. You can use voiceover, but film is very unforgiving of long speeches. Occasionally, you'll get a virtuoso moment in a film, but, but basically, everything I've ever written, they've chopped the words back. And so, I think, I, with film, if I've got an idea that's, that works visually, that's emotional, that where the characters are strong, that, that will work as a movie. If I want to write about what happens inside my characters, I'll, I'll turn it into a novel. I'm very, very interested in um, relationships, in how people cope with you know, love and loss and um, confusion and sex and all that kind of stuff. And I've written a lot of novels recently in which I've really gone into all of that in a way that I think has been, been very honest and, and very true. Um, and they wouldn't work as films at all. So that's how I decide. I, I would stay with novels all the time if I could, to be honest with you, um, because writing films is so painful. But it's also good for me. It really is. If I was just doing novels, I mean, novelists end up in a sort of little bubble of their own ego and they get lost because there's no one else around. So I think all my screen work has massively helped my novels and vice versa. Have you always had that sort of Zen sort of philosophy of moving forward and flowing like water? Or is there a particular event within your career which has kind of spurred that along? I didn't always have it at all. Um, I mean, I, 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 I was the exact opposite. When I was writing my novels before <coughs> any of them were published, I regarded you know, everything I wrote as having a sort of sacred quality that had to be preserved. And I resented any any comment that, uh, against it, um, I think it was beaten out of me by the screenwriting process. And it, when I first, <clears throat> my, my early work in television, I was working with friends and that was all fine. Um, Shadowlands was, uh, became a Hollywood picture, but I'd pretty much done it. By the time Richard Attenborough came along, he just took the script I'd written and, and shot it. From that moment on, everything I did was tough. And I think it's a kind of adapt or survive thing. You, you either go zen or you die. And, um, and I just decided to be grateful for the money, to be grateful for the fun, to be grateful for the interesting people, and to not cling on to anything. It's helped by the fact that I've always had a very bad memory. And having a bad memory is, is, is actually not, not a good thing. I mean, obviously. But... It helps me. I mean, my, my novels, my films, I can't remember what happens in them. <laughs> so sometimes I'll reread them. I'll go, God, that's clever. Where do you get that from? And it's as if I have a brain that just drops stuff as soon as I've stopped working on it. While I'm working on something, I can hold an immense amount of information in my head. But the minute it's done, it's like my brain says, OK, go. And that has been quite helpful to me, actually. Um, it becomes less hurtful when, when things vanish. And uh, I mean, even now, I've, I've just recently done something, a piece of, of writing work, which I've sent out to my agents. And I've got a feeling they're not going to like it. And they're going to say, we can't sell this. And who's going to buy it? And who's going to read it? And who's it aimed at? Um, <clears throat> because it's about a talking animal who gives relationship advice, which is not necessarily a kind of slam dunk. And, um, but the great thing is, I've already forgotten I've written it. So uh, when eventually I get an email saying, you know, dear Bill, we absolutely adored everything you did here, but unfortunately we're going to throw it away, which is an uh, email I've received many a time in my life, it'll be hurtful, but only for a moment. So <laughs> I think, you know, be, be a bit forgetful <laughs> in order, uh, order to survive. Also, you know, keep things in perspective, for God's sake. Um, I mean, I... <laughs> how lucky anybody is to get any work through at all, ever. And if you've managed that, fantastic. And also, how lucky you are to be excited by doing something, even if it doesn't go anywhere. You know, you're already ahead of the game. There are a whole lot of people who are driving lorries or working as lawyers who hate every minute of what Hang they on. do. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> and so get it in perspective and say, I'm winning, I'm winning, I've already won. And if something 
actually works out. Wow, you know, that, that, that's it. And you've got all the rest of your life to have fun in um, rather than being in a state of anxiousness and regret and fear and misery. Um, so if you can kind of switch your brain around like that, you're in with a chance. It was fascinating to hear about the production chaos on uh, Gladiator. Ultimately, the film seemed very coherent to me. I just wondered how you stewarded it to something so uh, coherent, ultimately. Did you stay on for the edit? Actually, it's the best way to write a film because you're seeing all the scenes as you go along. I mean, who knew that Herkim Phoenix was a complete genius? And you suddenly think, wow, if he can do that, we can do this, you know? And um, so we were reacting as we shot it to what was happening. It's not, it's not good for your um, digestion, that sort of <laughs> filmmaking. But it really means you can get it right as you go along. And um, I almost would love to do that, get together a group of people and say, let's work it out as we're going along. I believe some quite famous films did happen like this. Um, nobody wants it. It's terrifying. And there's so much money that could be lost. In that particular case, it worked. A lot of times it doesn't. And it worked because I think the core group was very um, close-knit, very honest, um, and crucially, Ridley, as a director, is extremely open. He's very excited by, oh, wow, here's a new scene. We can do this, we can do that, rather than trying to impose some kind of auteur vision. Ridley is not an auteur. You, you can't really, well, you can tell a Ridley Scott film because they just look so fabulous. But in terms of the subject matter, you can't. In that sense, he's a kind of uber craftsman. And that was wonderful for us. I think I've worked on other films where the director thinks that they are the author, and you know that can go badly wrong. So it was kind of exciting, and it gave us an opportunity. And it wasn't just that. The music, for example, the, the Hans Zimmer, who did the music, delivered a whole uh, musical score. And Walter Parks, who was very influential on the film, said, it's not working. Start again. And suddenly, with like three weeks to go, he had to start. And it, it put a bomb under him. And I think it's one of the greatest musical scores there is, yeah. the Gladiator score. And I didn't know that I wasn't present while this was happening. I was told this afterwards. And I think all of us were in that place that said, uh, you know, we're fashioning something as we go along. Let's not be satisfied with anything that isn't quite working. Let's get it right. And. Um, and in that, in that instance, it, it, it worked. There are other examples, I'm sure, where, where it, it doesn't. And nobody wants to, to be in that place. And it takes a lot of goodwill and a lot of, of non-ego. I think that's probably the key to it. The, the, the key people were very low ego. Ridley is very low ego, which is just superb. And um, the producer was very low ego. Walter Park's got a very high ego, but he was in Los Angeles, so that was all right. And, um, and, and also, he's very, very good, very, very smart guy. So I think, um, and you know, my ego, as I've described to you, had been kind of crushed and pushed into a, the background long ago. So I was just glad if anything seemed to be working. So I think that was the secret of that particular film. But there's a magic to it, you know. The casting was good. I've, I've worked on films. The film First Night that uh, Liz mentioned, um, which is an Arthurian film, and it's a triangle, a love triangle. And it was Sean Connery, Richard Gere, and Julia Ormond, who at that time was considered to be an up-and-coming, very hot actress. And she is uh, married to Sean Connery and in love with Richard Gere. And <clears throat> the problem all the way through was everybody said, who'd want Richard Gere if they could have Richard Sean Connery? It, it, it really messed with it, because Sean Connery is so charismatic. Um, that even though he was older, you just thought, come on. <laughs> and so I think casting is incredibly important. And actors' chemistry, this magical thing that can happen but doesn't always happen. And in Gladiator, you know, Russell Crowe had it. Herkham Phoenix had it. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, what's his name? Who did the emperor who died? His name I've gone and forgotten. Richard. Oh, Harris. Uh, Richard, Richard, Richard Harris, Harris had it. I mean, these were superb. Oh, Oliver Reed had it. These were superbly cast. And you don't always get that. And uh, I now realize, do you know what? If you cast it right, a lot else can go wrong, actually, and it can work.
So um, it's a scary industry. Nobody ever knows where the hits are coming from. They try to manufacture them, and they can't. They just sort of happen, which I guess is fun. And when it happens, it's magic. When it happens, when it happens, it's, it's, when it happens it's magic, yes, absolutely. I'm very much looking forward to going to see Dune. I love the book passionately, and apparently the film is spectacular. So uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm longing to, to see that, and of course I'm longing for the third series of Succession. Wonderful. I think that's all we have time for now, but could you please thank William Nicholson. Thank you.